Welcome everybody in person and on Zoom to today's speaker series. <laughs> um, my name is Julie. I'm your co-graduate coordinator with Sam Johnson. Um, we're really excited about today's lecture. Um, Greg is an alumni of our program, and so he has a lot of stories for us. Um, before we hear from Greg, I want to introduce Carolyn Lavois. Um, it's a great honor to introduce her. Um, Carolyn is a professor in the Program of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning. Um, she's won a design award for her, her teaching and excellence in landscape architecture from CELA. Um, she's an artist and has had her drawings exhibited around the world. Um, and she is an amazing teacher and has so much to share. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Carolyn. Thank you, Julie, that's very nice. Um, good afternoon for, I think I know most of you. So it's a very great for me also to be able to introduce uh, Greg. Uh, we worked together in 2018 for the uh, city of Ogden and we had our urban design studio there and it was phenomenal. Um, uh, teamwork and uh, partnerships, so it was really great and award-winning work. But so Greg is, uh, has a BLA and from uh, 1980, and he's uh, presently a planning division manager for Ogden. And so after graduating from Utah State, he worked for Ogden City for a year under a federal grant program called UPARR, which stands for Urban Park and Recreation Recovery. So this opportunity of assessing all the city parks and infrastructure allowed him to, um, to work with the city planning office. And he took advantage of this opportunity to do as a visiting lecturer, Yann McCarg suggested to him then, that students trained in landscape architecture should infiltrate into all discipline and um, public realm. And so did, uh, Craig did and collaborate with two planners assigned to his department to employ design principles that could reshape the city of Ogden with the opening of a, um, a new downtown mall. So in the fall of 1981, Ogden city created its own planning department and um, Greg was invited to, uh, was offered a position to the new department. So he spent 40 years now uh, with the planning division in Ogden. And the first challenge began with helping the city uh, see the need for landscape architectural vision and revitalizing Ogden downtown core and the surrounding districts. So Greg received his American Institute of Certified Planner certificate in 1991. And during his tenure in planning uh, division, his influence um, many planning and design initiatives um, some include like the Ogden River Trail System, the protection of the foothill via Ogden Bonneville shoreline and connecting trail, the development of municipal garden inter interconnected at the um, city center and the preservation of Ogden District um, 25th Street. We're talking about that this morning. And in 2014, this, uh, the 25th District was named by the American Planning Association of one of the great American streets. Um, he was also the, um, in the uh, LEP, like the 28th, uh, the, the 2018 Fall Urban Design Studio for reinventing the rail yard. And this led also to most recently the Make Ogden Downtown Redevelopment Plan, which was approved in the fall of 2020. So really on a personal note, uh, I had a great experience. The students had a wonderful experience working with him in 2018. And then this morning, students had a great experience also with all the comments he was making for a presentation as well in the senior studio. So we're very pleased to uh, have him as a speaker today. And we're looking forward to this presentation. So thank you. Thank you, Carolyn, for that introduction. I appreciate it. And one of the things I think of that work with the students in 2018, as uh, Carolyn mentioned, 
the, the plan gave a vision way beyond what anyone could imagine. And as we took it to the public, as we took it to elected officials, and they could see beyond what they normally see of the community. Um, generally, oftentimes in different communities, we suffer from a complex that our community is not good enough, or our community doesn't have the things everyone else has. And this opened people's eyes to that there are other things out there that we have that we need to take advantage of. And as I mentioned, that then led to, to working with Design Workshop and, and Todd and that to create the Make, Make Ogden Plan, which is now beginning its implementation. So from a student's concept and ideas to create a buy-in of the community and of and public officials to now step forward to step forward and now actually seeing things begin to work, I think that's a great example of what things you as students in, in the department here can accomplish and make an influence into, into the communities that you may be involved with. And uh, as she did mention, I uh, graduated in 1980. I realized most of you were not even here at that time, but <laughs> I want to kind of uh, give you a couple of things. So the title of this, you may look at that and say, what is this about? This is the most bizarre title I've ever heard. Well, it will be. Um, one of the things I think that we, we face sometimes is our limited knowledge defining what we see the future being. Now, how many of you have this as your home computer? 1950, <laughs> what take, 1955, this appeared in Scientific America. This is a projection of what a home computer would look like in the year 2004. The caption reads, however, that the technology has not been invented yet to really see this happen. And as I see you pull up a laptop, you, oh, you have a book, okay. That looks like a laptop. Most laptops have had more power than what they thought this could ever do. But this was the vision based on what they knew and what they had of where we would be in the future. And sometimes we take a look as whether we're landscape architects, planners, whatever, and we use the present to constrain what the future will be. And that limits us in, in terms of where do we go with our plans? Where do we go with our thoughts? Where do we go with our designs? And I want to show this because Sometimes we let those things limit us and we may end up with a community that may look like this in the future, that may not work. This is the old days. This is where the LA department was, the Mechanical Arts Building, just uh, south of Old Main. It's now a parking lot. I tell my, my family, every school I've been to no longer exists. My elementary school is torn down, my junior high is torn down, my high school is torn down. Even my college building is torn down. I have no claim other than a piece of paper of where I was. And I heard someone complain about how the uh, senior studio was dingy and that, and they made some re re renovations this last uh, year or two. This was our studio. You walked up a pair of, of wooden steps that had this dent in the center of them from every other student walking up. So there was not even a, a level stair. It tread was worn out through with paths of the students going up and down to the, the design studio area. Here was the tools of the trade, a T-square, vellum, and also fodder. I didn't put fodder in here, but that went along too. Fodder led to vellum, a Leroy pen set. Does anyone have a Leroy pen set? You do, okay. <laughs> we got antique collectors here, good. And if you're really skilled, you actually had the lettering kit that went with the Leroy. So you could do different types of fonts in your, on your drawing. But generally, most of us couldn't afford the Leroy. So we used chart pad. You had to bar burnish the letters onto your, your drawing if you wanted real style, unless you want to do hand drawing. But that was it. Here were our textbooks. Uh, Kevin Lynch, the image of the city and, and uh, plan graphics, design with nature, the, the famous green book of the planners, yeah, landscape construction. This one I really, I, I pulled out and this is uh, designing with plants and, and Craig Johnson and Carlisle Becker had done this and they charged the outlandish $4.50 for this textbook, for that course. 
$4.50. I know Craig is, was made wealthy by that book. <laughs> Irrigation design. But the one that had the most impact on me was this book for $4.50, Conceptual Blockbusting. And in it, it started to make me think differently. How do I view things? How do, in our processes of trying to solve problems, what do we go through? Sometimes the things we end up doing is taking the most easiest route to come to a solution because we're pressed for time. But we don't sit back and think not only what the problem is, but maybe is there a wider set that is creating the problem? That if we solve the one issue, we may not solve the other issue, which is what's gonna make the holistic approach to a design or to a planning problem. That ability to think, I think, is one of the things that sets you as landscape architecture students apart. To see problems in a bigger perspective than just what is here and now. And that is a key, I think, that is important in, in all aspects of what we do. Now, as I said in on the lectures today, one thing that came back to me again, and I put in a slide, is that the principles of design don't change. Neither do the process of teaching them. Now we might call things differently. This is our course in 7680 and this year's course. Now, of course we had no digital drafting. The closest thing we, gave, we came to a, a site analysis was punching computer cards in either the, the uh, yes and no formats to create a, a, a map created by X's and O's. That was the technology of the day. But the principles were still the same. Two things that I think, and I've highlighted in red, the courses that are different, of course, digital drafting, 3D presentation. 3D presentation is making a model. I'm sure that's not what that means. <laughs> Architectural design, that's a course that I thought was really important to help me in my job today as, as planner to also understand architecture, because that is also part of the form of, of a community, a form of a neighborhood. And the comb combination of architecture and landscape architecture in creating those spaces is really important as we create communities that have lasting value to them. Of course, there are some emotional dramas that I think haven't changed. This was the letter saying, guess what? You get to go to the junior and senior class. Of course, the logo has changed for Utah State, but the letter was still had its importance. And then, what about all-nighters? Has that, has that changed? Is that something that still keeps going on? So my, my junior year, I got married. So I, I moved off campus. This is my basement apartment. And my wife took my picture because uh, she's saying, this is 4 a.m. in the morning. She says, what are you doing still up? Well, I'm getting my model put together for the class. It has to be done by 8 o'clock in the morning. And I'm sure no one now procrastinates and waits to the very last to try to get it completed. But back then, that's what sometimes took place. You look at the events that take place now, and sometimes we worry about where is the world going? 1980, Mount St. Helens, a, a disaster of great proportion. And I remember in May, when that took place, we'd be able to look out here and look to the east up to Idaho and at sunset still see the cloud of ash from Mount St. Helens in, in uh, Washington as it was coming across and went all the way across the world. A, a tremendous disaster that took place of, of natural proportions. And we look at the wildfires today and the smoke that's filled the valley and we've seen all summer long. But those natural disasters, the US Embassy had hostages that were kept for 444 days in, uh, in Iran. So political turmoil. Russia invades Afghanistan. That name comes up still today. And the U.S. boycotted the Olympics in 1980 because of that, because they were going to be held in Moscow. 17 people were killed in a race riot in Miami. Those tensions still take place today of racial equality and how do we get along with each other. Inflation, 13.5%, and interest rates were 21.5%. So we talk about today about the uh, unaffordability of housing. Well, you, when you have an interest rate of 21% on your home loan, that also created an unaffordable housing situation. Maybe the numbers and how it is applied is different, but it was still a concern even back then of where are we gonna go and, and what's gonna take place in the future. 
So the title of my, my lecture, Ian McCarr came to lecture us. And as he talked about various uh, aspects of, of landscape architecture and the things he'd been doing with environmental work, one of the challenges he gave to the students in the landscape Arch architecture department then was to go out because of the expertise that you have and the training you've received and infiltrate all aspects of design, whether that be engineering, whether that be planning, anything, politics, any of those things with your knowledge and the training you're receiving and be able to understand the broader whole picture, infiltrate so that can become a lasting legacy of the landscape architecture profession because of that understanding of where we're at. Oh, technical difficulties. Are we there? Okay, infiltration. By definition, it means to, to enter or become established gradually. Uh, this was a family vacation this year. We were crossing the Hoback River because across, across the river was an old thermal pond that had died, but it's still a great pond with habitat and animals around it. So we crossed the Hoback as we were up there in the Jackson area. Well, the next day, we went into the Tetons and a just deluge hit the Hoback area. So when we came back from our, our hike in the Tetons, the Hoback looked like this. It was mud. A landslide had been had created upstream, shut the road down. There had been a, a wildfire two or three years earlier, all that sediment now came into the Hoback. And so what had been a clear stream where you could see the pebbles, now you see, if you go, if you look, the, the river rising, the mud. We drove down to where the Hoback and the snake come together. And we noticed, you can see, use that little red. Here's the Hoback entering the snake. And you see the mud right along that edge. Now, I thought that was interesting because it gave us a good illustration of the dynamics that are always taking place within the water that we never see. But now you take one area polluted and one area clean, and you see what are the river dynamics of these two bodies, the snake being much larger, and how its force pushed the, the Hoback River to the side and kept it at bay. And so the water, the main water of the snake is nice and clean. But as you went down a little further, gradually the Hoback started to go into the snake. And after you get to the next bend, the snake is completely brown. Those are dynamics that are always taking place, but the, the, this uh, siltation gave us a good visualization of what is always taking place. And when McCarg talked about infiltration, he talked about how do we make ourselves known and how do we get into the mainstream of things? How do we take our influence and in being able to apply in all the different aspects of development. That's the infiltration he talked about. So graduation, we're doing our commencement exercise coming from Old Main to the spectrum. As we come to seventh north and eighth east from the fraternity house, this is the song that greets us as we do our commencement walk. Pink Floyd. I'm not going to play the whole album. So, isn't it interesting? The only thing I can remember about commencement was that moment walking past the, the fraternity house and that song playing. But there's something in that song 
that I think is important as, as you look to your future and we look to the things that we do, what is our place? The education we receive, how do we use it? And do we make a difference or do we become just another brick in the wall? Where's the influence and the abilities and the learning that you're getting and how can we apply it for now and in the future? Landscape architecture, I like this definition of the Sigma Lambda Alpha model. Embrace the whole of nature and art. Fit mankind to the earth and earth to mankind. The things that we learn to do are how do we work with nature? How do we take the environment we're in? And how do we make it a better place? How do we fit the things we're trying to accomplish and do and be and make it work so future generations also can enjoy those same things? How can we do those things? Well, as I, as I said, I'm a planner. I, I became that as a, a, my profession. So what is a planner? This is a list of things. They're an administrator trying to follow the rules and regulations, get other people to follow the rules and regulations, those type of things. They're a researcher trying to see what things will work better in the future. Why do people do what they do? What has been developed, can it be made better? How should we approach that? We analyze, we look at things, we observe, we teach, we try to help people learn. One of the things I've always tried to take advantage of is whenever I get a chance with a mayor or city council and we walk somewhere or we talk about design, I start to point out things and say, what do you feel? What do you think about this? Do you know why you feel that way? Do you know what makes that happen? You can't identify it, but let's, let me talk to you about it. Or if someone comes to the counter and, and is working on a plan and he said, you know, that's a good idea, but you know, you could do better and be, be less expensive to do it and, and be maintenance wise, save yourself a lot of money. Let me talk to you and show you some other things you could do to achieve the same goal you have. A lawyer, oh, <laughs> land use law, and, and you have to know it. You have to know the Supreme Court cases, what's going on. You have to keep up with every single thing that takes place each year. Whether the legislature is now trying to take away something that you feel is important, or whether just knowing at what point do you know the words what estoppel means? Do you know what taking means? Do you know what vested rights means? All those types of legal things that are involved in development. A preservationist. There are important parts of the community that you want to see retained. They are the identity and the blood of the community, preserving those things. Environmentalists. The worst thing we could do is pay tribute to the environment by calling a place that's completely developed, developed out after what it used to be. Maybe it's Forest Glen, now it's Forest Glen condos. You know, we need to preserve those areas that help make the environment sustainable, help make life sustainable, and help make our enjoyment of life sustainable. A consultant, trying to work with others. A counselor, again, trying to, to help people understand, designer, visionary, and last of all, a cat herder. Trying to get all the other departments on board to do the same things, whether it be the engineering department, the even the attorneys sometimes trying to bring them along to get to the same thoughts. Those are things that a planner does. But when you think about it and go back to that statement about, oh, will it go back? Maybe it won't go back. Of what a planner is, fitting mankind to the earth and the earth mankind. These are some of those steps. Uh oh, have I died? I don't know. <laughs> Whatever it is, I didn't do it. <laughs> we there? Okay. Oh. Uh oh. Is that not going to? Okay, click on it. Yeah. There. Observe what takes place. Last test of the shuttle booster. What happened to the noise of the crowd once the impact of the, the, the ignition actually hit them? You know, it was a lot slower than the light. But the crowd went silent. 
I think one of the things that's important with planning or whatever we do, design, is there's a lot of blitz, but the impact of it is afterwards. After the, the first excitement takes place, what is lasting and sustaining after that point? That is where the real impact is on people. That is where designing has its, its real key. So I'm gonna give you five lessons I've learned in the planning profession that I th hopefully are takeaways for you in whatever profession you pursue after your degree. Because uh, some of you will go different directions, but the things you learn here now will be valuable lessons to help you to succeed in whatever you're, you're gonna be doing. So first, take advantage of the opportunities to establish credibility and vision. So let me give you a story. Ogden's 25th Street. So back of the turn of the, of the uh, 19th century and 20th century, Ogden was a, a railroad community. It was the, the logo of the uh, Chamber of Commerce was, you can't get anywhere without going through Ogden. That's because all the rails came to Ogden and then you had to go the different directions, whether you're going from the West Coast to the East Coast, it how it had to take place in Ogden. So that led to a lot of uh, success and development. And 25th Street was at the end of the train station so this is the hospitality area, the entertainment area. And over time, it kept that reputation, but also got another reputation too. At the end of the 40s, the reputation of, of 25th Street was this is not a place to be found. This is not a place for a decent citizen to be located because the brothels, the, the bars. And then as those left, then there is no economic potential in this. Scrape it, down, scrape it down and let's start over because there's nothing of value here because value is based only on the activity that's taking place there. So when I came to the city as a planner, this is what 25th Street looked like. This is what the back alleys looked like behind the building on 25th Street. Gives you an idea of the condition it was in. Well, in 1977, a master plan was created as, as part of the redevelopment of 25th Street. And uh, Dave Bell and, and Jay Nelson were the firm that was involved in this design uh, plan. And uh, they really emphasized a lot of important things. They emphasized the key part 25th Street leads into connection, both of retail areas, Union Station, the municipal gardens and government complexes. And they did that analysis of these connections. They took a look at the street and said, and this goes to Todd's class today about street widths. It was a four lane highway with a, a, a center lane, uh, sidewalks were narrow. And they said, no, there's a better way. And that's, let's reduce those streets. Uh, let's make the sidewalks more walkable. Let's look at that approach. Well, the city did that and widened uh, the sidewalks reduced the street width, but it still wasn't successful because the thoughts were, well, if we make the designs, everything will, will happen based on, on that design happening. But there had to be another segment added to it. It had to be, how does this become attractive to businesses, which is what brings the people down. down. They won't just come because they have a nice sidewalk with some trees. They want to come because there's activities taking place. They want to come because this is the place to be seen. They want to come because this is a place that um, now is where everything's happening. So 25th Street today, a little bit different. Going with you. The back alley. Yeah. And they leave like right quick. They're already gone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You can see the uh, back alley and their talk about it. One of the things I took an opportunity to do is, as we were, moved our offices down to 25th Street, we were the only business on 25th Street. The other buildings were all vacant except for eight bars. So eight bars generally don't attract a lot of daytime traffic. Um, but to come to work, with, work for the city or do things for the city, you got to come to our office. We put it there. And we said, let's show people not only what they can do with their buildings, but what about the back space? So the, the director at the time says, could you do us a design for the back of our plaza 
back of our building to show what can take place. So this was the, the concept put together and this was the implementation of it. But the thing that I want to stress about it, not as so much the design, but the ability to take advantage of a situation. There was a, a need, there was a question of how can we show people what the potential is, and then implementing that to show them what could take place. That also then led to design guidelines for the rear, rear alley. And now the rear alley is where all the outdoor dining takes place. People could see that and said, okay, if they can do that there, what about behind my building, behind my building? And then we set designs to set the, the standards, the light standards, a, a continuous uh, walking path between businesses in that back alley. So others could follow that. And even the back of the designs of those buildings. Again, that's that building today, how that looks. So those design standards become important, but the, the key is taking advantage of those things. So this is 25th Street today, and it's a lot different than it was in 1980. And it is a place that is now recognized, as, as Carolyn mentioned, that, that received the, the Great Streets of America Award from the American Planning Association. Second, good, good ideas take time to fruition. Okay, I don't know how many of you know this plant, it's generally found in Southern Utah. It's, it's zone eight to zone nine is kind of where it's at. Great desert plant, very poisonous, but beauty because the flowers come out after midnight and stay till about noon and then shrivel up and come out again after midnight and stay till noon again. Well, I, I have an area of my, of my yard where I do desert plants and I had bought one from Southern Utah and brought it up and had kept it alive over two or three seasons. And I'd you know, put hay bales over and then the winter just to try to keep the roots from freezing and that. And gradually it died. This year, my daughter is building a house next to me. And as they were uh, moving the ground around on that, somehow, somewhere were seeds of this plant that have been dormant for eight years. And they popped up this year, no water, nothing took place, no, no coaxing, but it was disturbed enough that it sprung up again. Now I'm gonna to try to collect the seeds this fall so I can replant it again. But a lot of ideas have to go through that time period before they're accepted by people. That first time you plant it, the first time you talk about it, may not always reach, achieve the result you want, but that doesn't mean you failed. That means you're gonna to work toward making sure that takes place. So here's another story, Ogden's Municipal Gardens. Turn of the century, this is what it looked like in uh, 1910, 1920. Uh, the city hall is broken up into four quadrants. There's where the municipal building was, there was where the public space was, which is where this fountain is, was located. Uh, there's the uh, public library over here, there's a fire station and the public works on this section of the block. The only problem with the municipal gardens is the officials said, okay, this is a great space we have, but you know, it's public, it's free land, let's develop other things on this block. Let's go ahead, and I think one of the most important things to do, whoops, that jumped ahead, is let's put a jail on that property. So let's take that public space and put a jail. So this is the correlation between the jail and the entrance in the municipal building. Great entrance to the public, you know. Are you going to see the inmate or are you going to see the city? Or maybe you feel both are the same. But it was a terrible space. And it was a terrible use of public property. Well, forward on a couple of years after that took place, Dutch elm disease has now come to Utah. And the municipal gardens had a great stand of American elms, all starting to show the flags of Dutch elm disease took an opportunity to get a grant to look at how can we reforce the, the municipal gardens given Dutch Elm coming in. And so we, we developed a plan, we did, we did an analysis of the existing conditions of what's take place. And again, you see this analysis of, again, those key locations in that municipal gardens is at that corner that turns retail down 25th Street to the, to the Union Station to help, again, fortify the things we're, we're trying to accomplish. Well, I also in that analysis looked at all the uses that have taken place 
on that municipal block for since it was created. The uh, the light lines of the existing buildings, the dark lines were all the other uses that had taken place there. I remember as a kid um, on this public plaza right here, they actually had a Minuteman missile as the focal point. And I remember Christmas time hanging garland off the missile around. And so that's our Christmas decoration. Different time. Well, I had taken the opportunity to say not only let's look at the, how we can revegetate and, and deal with the loss of our canopies and look at other trees and work with the city's urban forester at the time, who is now the public works director. And that became a good link we've had all throughout our career because that first thing that brought us together of how do we both have a common goal to make municipal gardens a place that's still a public place. And I had suggested that we may even go beyond just looking at landscape schemes. Well, let me talk about restoring this to a civic spot. So in 1984, this article appeared in the paper. Fast forward now to 1990. The story behind this though, while this is published in the paper saying, let's even go beyond that. Let's look at the entire municipal block was the county wanted to do another addition to the jail saying, okay, public space, great, another free land for another addition to the jail, which defeats what we're trying to accomplish. However, politics got in, and as you see in this drawing, jail addition. But the politics were such that we created enough uproar with the steering committee that was created, and Leonard Grassley was one of the key parts of our steering committee. And you always need other people to have the similar voices, and Leonard was a key part of that. Um, and the, you know, Leonard passed away this year, but he was a key part of helping us make Ogden what it could become. Well, we got the county commissioners so riled up, they pulled us pulled off us of the off. project and said, we are no longer gonna have a steering committee because you're telling us jail does not belong on this property. Look for somewhere else. Let's do something else with this property. So they pulled us off, said, no, you're not gonna consider jail addition. That's off the table now. Now you can just talk about how do we design around a jail addition. I'll fast forward. The jail is now vacant and they're looking for a location to move the jail to where their other complex is. But what drove the jail was the free land. But in the end, that is not a sustainable thing because it didn't meet the services and is in the wrong spot. So through that process, It had to go to the year 2000. You saw that was uh, 1990. Year 2000, finally, we were able to bring about the development of the municipal gardens into a public civic space, connected, not divided by roads, not, do, not the big parking lot for the municipal, municipal building, and an area that is a public gathering space for concerts, for farmers markets, for all sorts of things. I'll add this in, this came from uh, the study of 2018, even going further on what the municipal gardens can become. So even though ideas get planted, they can be developed further and further along so that this is uh, the opening ceremony for Christmas Village each year at uh, the municipal gardens now. That could have never have happened under the past design. View with a wider perspective is another thing. So when you look at this picture, what is it that you see? Just somebody, what do you, what do you see in this picture? Pile of rocks, a lonely shrub. Okay. Yeah, so kind of like an edge of a mountain or something like that, where there, the tree is hanging on and all those type of things. Now, if I go to this, does that change your view of what you were looking at? Now it starts to ask some other questions. How is it even surviving? You know, how did those shrubs, how did those trees get on the top of that isolated pinnacle, if you will, and how does it keep living? Does the thermal mass of that rock help regulate temperature? Where does it get the nutrition? How does it retain water? All those other questions start coming up because now the focus of the, of the question is a lot larger. It's just not the, the one little linear thing. Mount Ogden Park in 1980. 
And um, what can I say about it? Ogden had a real good ability to misuse the foothills. You look at this and you see all the Jeep trails, all the bike trails that are all over the foothills. And uh, the, the only thing we had to add for the park was just a little frontage right along Taylor Avenue. That was the only development of the park, but everything else was just open game for whatever took place. Um, we, we talked about the idea, well, Oop, what happened there? Now I did it. There we go. The first thought was, okay, let's reuse this to a golf course. And in order to finance the golf course, we'll sell this part of the park off to become high-end housing. Well, that helped finance the golf course. But there was a larger thing that took place. And that was saying, while we're doing this, what about the foothills? because everyone uses this area to get up to Waterfall Canyon as a, nat as a hike. And now that we've cut off all the various accesses, what are we gonna to do to try to develop it and try to create something that's more than just Mount Ogden Park, but what about the whole front of the Wasatch Mountains along Ogden? How can we take that and develop that even further? Well, it wasn't without opposition because a lot of people had private property up there and their vision wasn't our vision. And how we were trying to get the public involved and, and look at trails had led to a lot of disputes. In fact, some of the, the trail plans we had led to this editorial cartoon about what trail development really meant. Well, we would have public hearings about this and people would give horror stories. And if you open the trail up in the foothills, people are gonna be stealing from our house. And you could just envision someone walking with a TV on their shoulders, they are down the trail because they've robbed the houses. The stories that became what would take place if we developed trails for the public good led to on this plan, the actual removal of this trail off the plan. We had the, all the property acquired. We had everything set. But the public who lived in that area did such an outcry that the city council said, no, give it back. We're not gonna do a trail here. It's just not worth it. Well, over years, this later editorial cartoon shows a different vision of what now people look at the trail system. You know, what are the sacrifices you're willing to make for the, for the public access? And the trail system in Ogden is one of those things that is now a beloved asset to the community. Every day, people are at the, at the trails, of the, all the different trailheads that we developed, all the different public hearings we went through to show people how these two can work together. You can live next to a trail and it doesn't mean life is terrible. In fact, that becomes an asset sometimes of why people want to buy homes close to that. But that taking advantage of opportunities and go beyond that of what this immediate thing is and see how it can go further. Look for opportunities to create win-win situations. This is a common thing planners face. They don't like, uh, well, people don't like planners to telling them what they need to do. So a lot of times state legislatures create laws based on a concern a citizen had, whether it's valid or not, now it's a horror story that becomes, I'll change your legislation so you can't do that. And we're facing some of those things in Utah, talking about, the limitation on communities to set design standards and different things like that. But very few designs that are, are begun with end up the way they were originally designed. There's always things that take place in between. For example, two Walmarts within three miles of each other. Why do you think one looks different than the other? Same corporation, same set of architects, same... Uh, development thought of the, the developer, why the difference? Any ideas? Code, yeah. What is required of them? And, and, and that code is set by the planning department trying to establish a vision of the community of what it can be and all the different aspects of what makes something livable. 
How about trees in the parking lot to make it cooler in the summer? How about pedestrian connections to get you uh, to the business? How about the business having some architectural character uh, rather than just straight center block? That code can make a lot of difference in how the same thing, same company, same architects will look at a project and do it, do the project. This is a project at the, the river project. Uh, the river project is an area between 20th and the Ogden River where it had been a, a blighted area. The city came in, did a redevelopment agency uh, action there, looked at acquiring properties. We, we did it not, not through condemnation, but working with people to show this could be a win for you. This is also a win for the community. And as we said with our first architect to do in the development, this is his scheme of an urban setting, housing. Well, we said that doesn't quite work. So we came up with this. Now this is even more like who wants to go up a set of stairs in the winter time to get to your front door that's all open and exposed. And how do these set of materials fit in an urban context? Well, finally, the project looked like this from those early beginnings working and helping people see that you can get more value if you do these type of things, but it also helps set the context of place and also says, this is a place I want to live in. Sometimes those battles are, are difficult. You got to choose which ones to, to take part. Again, 25th Street. This is under urban renewal, uh, two, -thirds of the, two thirds of the block between Lincoln and Wall had been demolished in the 1960s. And this had become a, a dirt parking lot. It had become movie sets for B-class movies. Um, but a set there, and it looked like, again, a blight to the area, even though everything was redeveloping around it. The city had acquired the properties and set to do development and set to work with developers. Today, this is how that making a lot of looks, fitting in context with the place, looking at architectural designs and schemes. This was something that was so important to us, we said we're willing to fight the battle to make sure the design fits the character and the context of, of the space. Some places may not be that important, but most are. One of the things to remember is the mutual respect for all professions, that we all need each other, whether it be the developer, the community goals, how we treat the environment. You know, sometimes we feel like we're, we're stepping on toes when we try to work together and we're cutting off supply. But really we're trying to all work together to make it a better situation. And if we have that in mind, we always can come out with a win-win situation. Lastly, learn to speak the language. So when you asked me earlier if I thought it was a good idea to buy stock, now, I don't know if you realize what those are. Those are stocks. That was a medieval way to public humili humiliate someone for doing a crime. You put them in the stocks, let them be in the public square for three days. But what is the language we speak? One of the visions we had in the, in the planning department was the interconnection of the river to downtown and creating a pedestrian and bike corridor called the Grand Avenue Promenade. We had proposed this early on because we thought these, again, are important links to the Union Station, the Municipal Gardens, uh, the Junction, which had replaced the old mall, and the Ogden River and the development that took place there. But the engineering department said, no way, no how are we gonna dedicate a street to bicycles and pedestrians. This is key to the corridor. This is key to overall circulation. You can't do that. And for two to three years, we just kind of butted heads, butted heads. Finally, we said, you know what? What are your goals and what are you trying to accomplish? And let's talk about how these two can work together. So for example, one of the goals, well, water quality. Well, let's design this so this becomes stormwater retention because all that surface runoff that comes from the road goes to the river. Well, we just spent $2 million in, in river revitalization Let's make sure the water that gets into the river is clean. So what's a way to do it? There's a great way to do it. And you know what? That can be a divider between the traffic and the bikes. 
So now we can accomplish something. Well, what about another idea? What about the traffic pattern? Well, there's three other roads. They can carry this capacity. This could be scaled down, still carry traffic, but the other roads function in that capacity level. And so that win-win becomes important. So kind of my concluding thought on this. I can tell you I don't have money, but what I do have are a very particular set of skills, skills I've acquired over a long, very long career. Of course, this is from the movie Taken, when he's the ransom for his daughter. Now, I'm not no Liam Neeson, but over time, and beginning now with the education you're receiving here, here, you're getting a set of skills, a very important set of skills that can be applied in many different situations. And over time, those skills will develop and you'll be able to understand them even more of how to apply that to fit man to the earth and earth to the man. To be able to create the environments that are sustainable, to create the places that people want to be at. And as you do that, you are no longer just a brick in the wall. You may not be identified, you may not have a lot of money, but the impact you have to others in future generations it can't, can't, be, can't be measured. Thank you for your time. I appreciate this opportunity to speak to you and, and good day. Good. Okay, um, well, thank you so much. That was so interesting to see the process of spaces that I go to, you know, um, often just for entertainment, to eat, you know, and how they change over time and how quickly they change. Um, that was really interesting. Um, so we had a couple minutes for questions. Um, I'll start with in-person questions. Helen. Thank you. Um, you were talking about, which I think is so important, about um, understand the battle to choose and um, could you tell a little bit about how do you prioritize with this? I think the priority begins with what are the key values of your community? For example, Ogden has identified its history as a key value, so historic preservation. It has identified that we wanted to come back as a, a regional center. And so, we look at those things, will this add to those two goals, those two things? Will this also make sure that the community can be sustainable? You know, what is the value it brings to the community? Is it something that will make a lasting value or is it just temporary? If it's something that's in an uh, area that's key, that will make a lasting value, yeah, that's something to really fight for to make sure it's done right. If it's off in the fringes some, sometimes, that may not be as key because it's, it's not in the main flow of things. This is our speaker from last time. <laughs> okay, so when you were doing the 25th Street, so you mentioned the design standards, you mentioned the um, sidewalks and public improvements. So I'm wondering, what did you do facade improvement program? Did you do, did the city put in parking, public parking? Did you use redevelopment funds? What else did you do to get over the hump? from what it was to what it is now? So the first part is yes, yes, and yes. So we, we did facade improvement loans. We did uh, tax increment financing. Uh, we did business loans. Uh, all those things to help them who were gonna take that risk to begin with, feel at least a little bit more comfortable in that risk because any type of, of restaurant, retail, those are always a risk. You don't know, is it gonna take place? Because one of the things about the 25th Street is the scale of the buildings is a very adaptable scale, but it also means it's a smaller scale. You can't rely on a big volume to, uh, to make the business work. You've gotta rely on, this is a place I like to come back and back and back and develop a clientele that's always gonna be there and be loyal, whether it be the restaurant business or, or, or retail business. And then we went on to add promotions. So 25th Street is closed well, probably 15 times a year. Uh, this next week is, is Harvest Moon. 
where the streets closed. Every Saturday before was farmer's market. There'll be the zombie crawl at the end of the month of October. Um, they're all car show, all sorts of things take place. Even the marathon, when, when the marathon is running, in the last two years it hasn't, finish line is on 25th Street. So we try to focus a lot of those things taking place there to get people down there. We did develop a parking area and, and part of our, our project now for the Make Ogden plan is developing even more parking because we're, we don't want uh, additional businesses to have to create their own parking lot. We want that centralized parking that all can participate in. In fact, that's one of the keys we're doing because one of the major owners who has a big parking lot there, we got to accommodate their parking, which is the state courts. Well, the parking structure we're going to build is going to also accommodate them so we can take that land and use it for, for better use of, of structures and spaces for people to be in. But as, as all those things combined, and we got to a point then we could wean off that because then people could say, oh, there is a value, and then that started to grow. So I'm wondering if you could give us some uh, maybe more details about the project in the foothills of Ogden. And then also just for your context, uh, we're working on a project in Salt Lake that is dealing with this interface between the, you know, the suburbs and then the foothills of the mountains. So I'm wondering if you have other ideas or principles that we could suggest or incorporate through other parts of the Wasatch Front. Well, one of the things we did we identified where are the key pe places people have already created a path. Um, but then we also identified, okay, they've, they've created that path going east up into the mountains, but what are then about, if they go up there, what can they do at that point? Is it just up and back? So we started to connect a, a network that both went east and west, north and south, so that you have options for trails connections. We worked with the Forest Service when we got to their land. In fact, um, we, we developed a real good relationship with the Forest Service. And as we started to develop our, our, our trail system and our, our trails committee, uh, they would come every spring and train their workers and build part of the trail in Ogden as part of their worker training on how do you construct trails and mountains. So we took advantage of that. We took advantage of, of the sympathy of some people saying, you know what, this really isn't developable land. Can we sell it to the city? And we looked at things like trust for public land to be a go-between. We looked at the exchanges with the Forest Service of where some private land would be, can they exchange and find a, 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 something that would be a win-win that could then get public ownership into the foothills again. We looked at um, some of those paths then uh, making those those loop connections for for the hiking experience and to have a, a variety of hikes not just one hike up and back creating that variety and start to lay out new trails and, and then had to work with the forest service to get those approved um, but then we had volunteers do the construction and that buy-in from volunteers doing the construction made them very protective now that what takes place on the trails is appropriate you know, if a trail starts to get to get torn up, they're there to fix it. If there's inappropriate actions, they, they come and say, look, what can we do to move forward with this? But I, I think a couple of things is, is that awareness of a public need, of the public enjoyment of it, looking for the systems that may already exist and how can you enhance those systems. And then where there are missing gaps, figure out how to make those, those gaps connect those are the, the key things we did. And then looking at other partners that can be involved with you in this, not just one group. It, it took all those groups to help us move forward. What's the most satisfying aspect of your job? You've got 40 years of reflection. Describe Describe the stages. What was satisfying when you first got into it? I think a lot of students are excited about the opportunity of a career. Maybe they don't, you know, you know. I just think it's really interesting to ask people what what satisfies you about it and what was the evolution of that? 
Well, I, I think the evolution of it was uh, when I first did that, that park plan and meeting with people to see that there were needs out there and that they didn't have a real voice of how do we move forward to see our needs fulfilled. Um, and I think as we started to you know, propose ideas, look at how can this be accomplished, how can we finance it, how can we do different things, and then to see it actually built was something that then said, look, their voice was heard and, and I moved forward. And to now go from where Ogden had been to where it is now, and it's still not complete, there's lots of, lots of things we gotta do. But to see each of those steps come back and people now say, I live in Ogden, rather than, yeah, I live in Ogden. You know, um, that is, I think that's the satisfaction, that they see things, they enjoy things, seeing people on the trails that didn't exist, you know, other than very uh, pioneering type situation. And, and seeing that activity take place, seeing 25th Street, I mean, 25th Street has been a lot of my life. And, and to see where it was to where it is now, um, to see the junction, to see the river project, seeing those things happen and, and just sit back and now watch people uh, move about in those spaces, live in those spaces, enjoy those spaces, having problems like, there's no place to park now. That's a great problem. You know, I always joke, um, when the jail was built up until about 2002, the jail was our nighttime population. No one lived downtown but the inmates. So that doesn't tell you a lot about how good the community is. Now, there are a lot, there's lots of housing downtown and you don't have to be sentenced to be there. It's a choice. And so those are things I think that, that are satisfaction too. <laughs> the jail actually was on the uh, uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th floors of the municipal building where our office is. And when we, <laughs> yeah, it was a high rise. Well, it was interesting because, you know, it made escaping a little bit more challenging because when you saw a sheet hanging out the window, you knew what was taking place. <laughs> you didn't have a lot of security situations you have to go through. You just look out the window. Oh, there's a sheet. Someone's trying to leave. Anyway. <laughs> I think we have one more question in the back. So with, with your career, you mentioned quite a bit being patient in the process. What do I know it might be Captain Obvious question, but what did you do in that time frame when you're being patient in the process? You're actually actively doing things to help it go along. What were some of the main things you did being in that process waiting for things to come together again? To get over the hurdle. I, right. The key part of it is like the uh, the Tura, the, the plant I talked about, is keep bringing the seed up and up again, saying whenever opportunity existed, like the, the bringing the municipal guards together to make it a civic space rather than four quadrants of different uses. Just keep bringing up that idea. It's, oh, do you see what so-and-so did? You know, that could happen here. What about this? That could happen here. And it's just not giving up on the ideas that are good. Good ideas will surface and keep coming back. And that became, if you will, the patience part of it, is just bringing up those ideas again till some other people start to also believe in it. And you get enough of it, then you see the political action take place. And so that, I, that's that teaching moment. Whatever opportunity I had to, to share the ideas, to get people to think about it, you know, I don't expect a, 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 a oh, yeah, I agree with you. They've got to come to their own conclusions, but you give them the reasons why that conclusion is good. Yes. Yep. Both to the planning commissions, to the politicians, and just general public meetings, as we had a public input meetings for the, the downtown and its plan, or a community plan in other locations. Bringing those ideas and working with people, and then they start to take those ideas and they become their ideas now. And the more of that you can bring about, then the easier it is to see that come to fulfillment. I 
I don't. <laughs> but I'm sure I did it. <laughs> oh. Oh. Well, you know, a couple things that took place um, as some developments we proposed. And, um, you know, it started to say like, well, wait, wh why are you allowing this here? I said, well, you know, you, we've got these different situations. Well, what can we do to help? Because we've made this investment in communities. That's not going to help our investment. I said, well, you talk to the leaders who are going to be doing the approvals. You talk to them of what, what you expect to happen and what you've done already to make an investment based on this future idea and help them see this is not taking you to where you thought we were going. Why would they give up on that dream now? And so that type of, that type of thing going on. Yeah. I'm one of our people online. I wanted to make sure I asked you. Um, so I'm sure it changed over time with the evolution of Ogden, um, but how did you determine the priorities of the community and how did you um, engage with the community? Well, the, the priorities were really set when we did the uh, 2002 general plan. The city's general plan prior to that time Oh, it was kind of hit and miss. We, we really didn't have a comprehensive plan. And we hired consultants to come in. And through that, each area of the general plan, we would have steering committees of citizens of the community. And they would start to address key things or, or, or thoughts they had of how do we make the community better? Because there was a real concern. We had brought in earlier a RUDAT team, which was from the AIA. They kind of give you an idea of what your community has, what are, what are its bones, and what can you build upon? And that started to get people thinking. So when we came to now the general plan amendment or development and that involvement for the public, I mean, that was a two-year process. It wasn't just something you were going to do overnight and push through. You had to get everyone involved in talking about it and having it as discussions. And that, that synergy that was created saying, oh, yeah, we can see something happening in the community. That set the goal. Then we, we said, okay, what is our bandwidth in terms of redevelopment agencies and what they can help do uh, to, to spur that development forward? And the redevelopment agencies would then take a look and say, okay, if we focus in on this piece and this piece, these will be the key catalysts to then start something else connecting between the two. And so is that general plan to begin with that identified what does the community see now as their mission, as their future, and staying true to that community plan. And then later we'd go after the general plan, we'd go to the different neighborhoods and say, okay, now let's say, how does that general plan work for your community? Let's fine tune it now to your community so that you can also see benefits in your neighborhood rather than the city as a whole, knowing that both are important for the, for the livability. And as we went to each community plan, then that got another group of citizens involved, another group of citizens seeing what can we do? What can we be part of? And that helps just build upon itself. But the strategy was what are our chief goals identified by the public? What can we use as redevelopment agency to spearhead f financing to get to that part? And then what is our long-term goal to then fill in those gaps afterwards that are created. Sounds like quite a dedicated process. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well, I want to be sensitive of everyone's time. So I think we're going to wrap up. Um, I'd like to invite the graduate students here to come up to the common studio um, with Greg to have just an extended conversation. Um, but thank you everyone for coming and let's give Greg another hand. <laughs>